a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us for the session today uh, for those of you not familiar with anvation let me just uh, give you a brief idea uh, about it uh, we're a forum of academicians researchers journalists and activists who share a commitment to the idea of social transformation and we've been active for many years and uh, since the onset of the pandemic last year we've regularly been organizing online talks and discussions around the social economic and political topics that are relevant to a progressive idea of change uh, for those of you who wish to know more about anvation please feel free to write to us i am going to share my uh, our email id in the chat box anvation secretary at gmail.com please uh, feel free to reach out to us so uh, we're here for the first session of what gorab has called a censored weekend and uh, before getting to the first session let me in brief just tell you about the second session that we are going to have tomorrow uh, we'll have a film screening tomorrow it's a documentary called gay india matrimony uh, it's directed by debulina majumdar that revolves around three characters who are out exploring their marriage prospects with one of them documenting their travels uh, all three of them are looking for a same gender partner and the very suggestion of wanting to marry a same gender partner throws people around them into a complete frenzy uh, it's been shot over 5 years and it captures a watershed move, moment of uh, reading down of the section 377 uh, from celebration to critique from social to biological uh, and from political uh, from economic to political the film takes the viewer on a panoramic ride of marriage so the film so to say it breaks away from conforming to the censored boundaries uh, of the way sexuality and marriage is embedded in conventional imagination so that's the second session tomorrow and there is a compulsory registration for it i am also going to share uh, the registration link for it uh, the coming back to today's session uh, it's very appropriately titled uh, censorship in cinema understanding laws and creative resistances uh, as you all know censorship and cinema share a very uncomfortable relationship since cinema has been an important medium of political and social resistance uh, authoritarian governments have time and again resorted to their control over the power of creative expression and if cinema holds the mirror to social reality the despot makes all possible attempts to obstruct the mirror so what we've observed recently something similar uh, there's an appropriation of cinema cinematic structures by the state Uh, along with increasing restrictions on the creative liberties of artists and without taking much time i'll invite uh, the two speakers that we have for this session the first speaker is sunil shanbag he is a theater director and also a winner of the national film award and a winner of the sangeet natak academy award uh, sunil will be talking about censorship and theater we also have with us nikhil narkar who teaches cinema at the school of liberal arts symbiosis pune he is pursuing his phd in cinema studies at the school of arts and aesthetics jnu uh, he is also a film a documentary filmmaker and has produced a few short films he is associated with the pune collective which works towards social transformation through dialogues and cultural activities so uh, welcome sunil and nikhil thank you uh, and i'll invite the first speaker sunil uh, sunil over to you All right. Thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me to this very very interesting uh, evening. Um, just I just give you a brief you know background to the whole idea of censorship uh, in the theater and make some connections with a piece of work that we created that actually examined this. It might be of interest to uh, some of you. So I'll set that up and then of course after Nikhil does it, then we'll be very happy to take uh, questions about more specific things. uh <clears throat> so uh our first uh, encounter with the whole idea of you know official formal state censorship comes around 1876 with the enactment of the dramatic performances act uh, by the british colonialists right so britain interesting they already had a sort of formal uh, licensing of plays procedure in place uh, right from 1737 and it's interesting to know that it was set up with the idea of essentially restricting criticism of the state of you know leaders etc and um, i think it was in 1843 that this was formalized into a theater act 
uh, where you know the Lord Chamberlain's office really and, and people employed with the Lord Chamberlain, they had readers, etc. Uh, they willy-nilly became the arbiters of uh, morality and aesthetics on the British stage. Uh, so this went on for a long time. I mean, you know, it was perhaps in the, I think around 1960s or so, there was increasing discomfort with the idea of having your play scrutinized before a performance. And I think there were two plays that created a bit of a stir. Um, uh, one was a play by Edward Bond called Saved, um, which is, which kind of in a sense depicted social reality and a fairly critical play of, you know, cultural poverty and frustration of a generation of young people living in those, you know, huge social housing estates, etc. And very soon around the same time, there was another play by uh, John Osborne called uh, by A Patriot for Me, um, which is essentially, you know, based on the true story of uh, a gay person, Alfred Redl, who was a person in the Austro-Hungarian intelligence service. And what really disturbed the Lord Chamberlain and his people was this, you know, the last scene was the climactic scene was a huge drag ball that takes place. And they said, no, 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 we can't have this on the stage. But uh, the, the restrictions on those two plays led to a fair amount of discussion and, you know, fairly large, very, very senior theatre people, even those who tread the middle road, you know, came out uh, in support of these plays and against the idea of uh, censorship. So. It's as late as 1968 that the the, the British, uh, you know, the, the Theatre Act really was uh, removed, and there's no uh, formal uh, censorship of theatre. In India, it's actually very interesting because you know the whole idea of the censorship act was very closely linked to the idea of sedition, right? Uh, and that's what makes it really, really important for us to look at it and be, understand exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, we are talking around in the between 1860 onwards, there's a growing uh, resistance, there's a growing nationalist spirit and a growing resistance to colonial rule. And really, the Dramatic Performances Act comes about as a measure against this, you know, growing stage and also the political uh, repertoire that some of them had. Uh, it's interesting to note that in the period of 10 years, there were four repressive measures taken by the government. The uh, amendment of the Indian Penal Code, the Dramatic Performances Act, the Vernacular Press Act, which was basically enacted to suppress and restrict the vernacular press, and the Arms Act. So it's interesting that the, the, the censorship laws, which stayed on after independence, actually, and you know, we, we've continued the same thing, just like you continued the sedition law, uh, also the Dramatic Performances Act that uh, not all of India have, but there are two states, Maharashtra and Gujarat, that continue having that. And uh, all of us in Maharashtra and Gujarat submit all our scripts for, you know, scrutiny. Uh, it's very interesting that it's connected to sedition. Um, the idea of sedition in a colonial context is something that we can talk about. But the idea of sedition in a democracy sounds completely absurd. Yeah. So the fact that it remains uh, really says something. Uh, three plays that kind of represent the growing nationalistic spirit, uh, all of them in Bengal, and then of course the, the the scene also shifts to Maharashtra with you know growing nationalist spirit there. Um, <clears throat> everybody knows about Deen Bandhu Mitra's Neil Darpan, of course, and there are two other plays. Uh, Surendra Binodini Natak is a very interesting play in which uh, a character uh, Bira, uh, Biraj Mohini. Uh, it's being shown and being treated with great cruelty by a British magistrate. And a few scenes later, a huge crowd uh, breaks open the prison and, and kills the magistrate. And, you know, uh, the, 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 the British state decided that this was not going to be allowed. But they charged them with obscenity, right? And the proprietor, the manager, the dance master and several leading actors were all arrested. Uh, the low court found them guilty, but the high court in Calcutta said there's, there's no obscenity in this play and they were acquitted. So actually what happened was that it kind of, you know, backfired on them. They, they, they didn't want to ban it and, you know, arrest them under the fact, you know, with the fact that it was sedition. They used the excuse of obscenity, but that backfired on them. So uh, people writing at that time talk about it as a, an example of judicial honesty, you know, something that we have been struggling with in our country over the last few years. Uh, and uh, so there was a kind of an executive intervention 
to prevent judicial honesty. I just love these terms. And the executive precaution against judicial honesty was the Dramatic Performances Act of 1876, right? So these are the origins really. Uh, the law is deliberately open to interpretation using, you know, broad phrases like, uh, you know, well, any dramatic performance which is scandalous, defamatory, likely to cause feelings of disaffection, likely to cause pain to any private party in its performance or is otherwise prejudicial to the interests of the public might be prevented from being performed, right? So this is, as you can imagine, uh, there is there's no, no, there's no specific definitions to any of these terms and it's really open to interpretation, um, you know, as, as would suit the convenience at that time. Um, in Maharashtra, this transfer from Bengal to Maharashtra, you know, with the with the rise of the nationalist movement there, and the most famous play, I think, that from that period would be Khadilkar's Kichagwad, which used a mythological story really to talk about, you know, the uh, the the colonial experience and the resistance to the colonial experience. But there's an interesting thing that often gets missed out, you know, when there are studies on this whole question of censorship in India in the Indian theatre. You know, when, when the pandemic started, you know, the first lockdown, I was quite intrigued. I wanted to know, you know, what had happened in the past when, when you know, the city had been locked down and what happened to theater at that time. And that took me to reading about the great plague in, in Bombay in 1896, you know, where there was similar, there was a plague and, the, and you know, there was, there was a huge exodus of migrants to out of the city, carrying the plague with them and the port was shut down, all sorts of things happened. And I was looking at the parallels and I came across this very interesting development that took place, which effectively handed over the, con the, the, the control of the city's open and public spaces to the state. Okay. And also allowing the police to decide what is against public order again, you know, again, a very, very vague term. So the genesis of this tight control. So today, you know, anybody who does street theater, for instance, and you know, a lot of street theater is political and is aimed at, you know, empowering people and talking about political issues. And you know how, how difficult it is to use public spaces in this, in, in our country generally, and in Bombay particularly so. Uh, so the genesis of this tight control, interestingly, goes back to the Great Plague uh, and the subsequent City Police Act of 1902 in Bombay and, you know, Delhi has had its own Police Act, etc. Uh, in other cities also. Um, and it's like, a, you know, reading about this is like a feeling of deja vu because you can see tremendous parallels. So uh, there were a series of riots and public disturbances in working class areas in Bombay and uh, draconian anti-plague measures were taken and, you know, the, the people were resisting that and there were riots. And it led to an anxiety among the colonial authorities about their ability to control such conflict. So, uh, and I'm quoting now from a very interesting research paper titled The Ultimate Masters of the City, Police, Public Order in the Poor in Colonial uh, Bombay, uh, 1893 to 1914. Prashant Kidambi is a scholar and I'm quoting now from him and I'm just going to read out the thing. So he says, the participation of the poor in the urban riots was not the only source of anxiety for Bombay's ruling authorities. An equally significant cause for concern was an emergent proletarian casual economy and public culture centered on the street. A fast growing casual labor market meant that people not just lived on the street, but also engaged in cultural activities ranging from akharas, tamasha performances and gatherings around, of course, liquor shops. This casual economy and the public culture was seen as a threat. So the City Police Act of 1902 vested in the police exhaustive powers that even today give them the authority to define public areas and control and regulate all activity on them. Among them processions, assembly, music, singing, uh, a colonial legacy that res restricts access to the arts in public areas where it is needed the most, right? Uh, so it's interesting that even today in Maharashtra, the authority responsible for giving us licenses to perform uh, is the Bombay police, right? It's not any other civil authority, it's the Bombay police that's directly responsible. Uh, so as I said earlier, Maharashtra and Gujarati are probably, Gujarat are probably the only two remaining states in India, which have a, a version of, you know, a, a theater sensor body. In Maharashtra it's called the State Scrutiny Board. Uh, at its best and least harmful, the censorship procedure is a bureaucratic inconvenience 
but at its worst, it has actually restricted and even stopped the performance of plays that are seen that they are understanding infringing the law. So, in around 2012, we started looking at the idea of, you know, censorship in our theater and we wanted to work a play around it, uh, 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 you know, I, I, it was basically a theatrical argument that I wanted to present on the idea of censorship. And our research and conversations with many people made us appreciate many more nuances. State censorship, all right, is structured around laws, all right, so it's a fairly structured thing. Uh, appeals can be made to a higher authority okay and there is some there is some procedure for redress all right but how effective it is it's another matter but these are available on the other hand censorship of the street of the mob is completely unpredictable there are no such you know mitigating things like you know appeal or redress etc in fact even a reasonable discussion or an argument often is impossible because very often it is a notion it's an idea most of the time they haven't even seen the work of art as we all know so it's a very unpredictable and very very dangerous form of censorship that we have to deal with <laughs> but there is a quieter and a you know in a kind of a, a more more insidious form of censorship which comes from the form of disapproval uh, from the more powerful upper class upper caste sections of society especially towards smaller littler traditions like the folk traditions and you know sociologists will call this a process of sanitization where you clean up what doesn't seem to fit into your notions of what is good clean you know entertainment uh, and and often you just appropriate the tradition and completely wipe it out like what happened in tamasha in in, in maharashtra for instance uh, there is no recourse to the law here of course and these were some of the things and ideas of censorship in the theater that actually guided the making of the play um, when you talk about you know censorship in theater in maharashtra you can't uh, avoid talking about Sakharam Binder, the 1972 production um, of Vijay Tendulkar's play. Uh, Sakharam Binder, the, 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 the attack on Sakharam Binder, the censor board came on the heels of an attack on his earlier play, Gidade. So there was a kind of already a momentum that had built up. And I think it was also a historical moment when there was a backlash from conservative society because, you know, in the 70s, there was a freeing up of many things. And this was also, I think, in many ways, you know, represented the backlash. Uh, but the other thing was that uh, Kamlakar Sarang, who produced and directed the play, also maintained a very rigorous diary of the troubles that the play went through. And, you know, it was called Binder Chidivas, that is the Binder Days. And that diary is a well-known, you know, document in, in, in Marathi uh, literary circles. And there's a detailed, you know, documentation, something that we usually don't have access to in, 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 in India. Uh, Shanta Gokhale, the playwright and the critic who actually, you know, helped conceive and build the idea of the play. She was the one who actually insisted that we need a layer of, you know, how Tamasha and, uh, and the folk art that was parallel to Sakharam Binder in many ways was, had been sanitized and had been cleaned up and had been subject to social censorship as a kind of a counterpoint to this very urban theater uh, practice. Uh, so that was another layer in the play. And we also looked at why is it at a particular time a piece of art comes under attack. So we wanted to look at what was happening in the theater scene around Sakharam Binder. Meaning if you opened a newspaper and you looked at the ad of Sakharam Binder, what were the other plays that were being performed around it? It would, it would sort of, you know, give us an idea of the context in which Sakharam Binder created such hostility. Uh, or what were the ads that were out there? What were the sentiments? And we discovered that there was a very strong, you know, very strong way of sentimentalism, romanticism that was going on. And it's no wonder that a hard hitting play like Sakharam Binder, which is so sharp in, you know, in its social reality, uh, creates such hostility. Uh, we also, also helped us actually look at the various strategies uh, that were employed, uh, you know, um, by by Kamlakar Sarang and his lawyer um, to actually fight this case in a court of law. And it'd be interesting to note that eventually they won the case on a technicality and not on the point of freedom of expression or, you know, free speech or any of that, uh, artistic freedom, none of that. In fact, the lawyer advised uh, Kamlakar, don't even get into that because that is so subjective that, you know, the chances that you may never get, you may never win. So it was on the technicality that there was no, at that time, there was no, uh, there was no way somebody could appeal against a ruling of the censor board. And this was found to be a problematic thing against natural law. And so the, the ban was lifted. 
so this is basically how we worked on the play itself. A big question that is often put to me is, then why does state censorship remain in Maharashtra? Okay, it's a bit embarrassing, you know, to from th get this question from theater colleagues all over the country who who actually don't have to deal with censorship. And why is it that Maharashtra, which has such a, you know, you know, such an active theater scene, and it's really part of tradition, also part of a, you know, the theater scene pre-independence, which was very nationalistic and, you know, in spirit. And um, why is it that we uh, still have censorship here? And why haven't we got rid of it, like say Tamil Nadu has in many other places? Well, uh, as we know, theater practice is not homogeneous anywhere in the country. You know, there are many kinds of theater practice. And so there are many kinds of theater practitioners, many ideologies at play. Uh, unfortunately, there's a very large um, and influential section of the Mumbai theater, Maharashtra's theater scene that is really, uh, is actually in fact supportive of the idea of censorship, right? Uh, I think it's a very, very uh, short-sighted thing, but there it is. And um, so that's really difficult to break through that resistance. Uh, you know, it's the usual argument that why are you worried? If you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't be worried. No, it's because you guys are doing something wrong that you're worried about. This. You know, it's that typical argument that is trotted out. Uh, the other reason is that some people genuinely believe that the existence of a census certificate allowing you to perform becomes a kind of a protection against uh, uh, an attack by you know, a mob by the crowd and says, you know, shut the play down. But you say, look, I have a census certificate. But, you know, as we all know, that is not worth a piece of the piece of paper on which it's written eventually at the end of the day. There have been occasions. Uh, there was a play on uh, Hussein, the painter, uh, being performed at Prithvi Theatre and the, the performance was threatened by, a you know, some small right wing fringe group. Uh, and the theater management actually went to the police and said, look, we have a census certificate, it's legally allowed to perform, you have to come and protect us. And fortunately, the police showed up and the performance went along. But for that one case, there are any number of cases where the police will say, oh, yes, you have the permission to perform, but it can cause a law and order situation. So we're shutting you down. And, you know, then that census certificate is worth nothing. Uh, Pre-censorship of a live show is, is considered absurd as it would mean monitoring every performance. Uh, so very often theater people just formally accept all the cuts and go ahead and just do exactly what they had want to do in any case. Um, this strategy is under threat because of, you know, growing technology and, you know, everybody has a mobile phone, somebody just shoots a little bit and they record it and then that's used as evidence and an FIR is filed against you. There are numerous uh, in you know uh, examples of this happening so i don't think this is going to work as a strategy uh, a few years ago actor director amol palikar in fact did move the mumbai high court to strike down theater censorship um i am not aware of what has happened i know that it hasn't been resolved uh, but i don't know what the latest position is but the case has been on for a few years so this is where we stand at the moment um i'd be very happy to take specific questions uh, as we go along. Thank you so much. Over to you, to Nikhil. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. That was uh, really enlightening. I mean, for a student of cinema to uh, see there are so many parallels uh, in theater and cinema that go hand in hand, not only in the history of independent India, but also colonial India. Okay, and some of the uh, things that you were talking about, about how censorship actually came into being through the colonial history. Mm, you know, the uh, censorship came uh, into cinema uh, using the pretext that we have some kind of censorship for plays and, you know, uh, performances and, and public order and incitement, etc, etc, etc. Okay, and, uh, you know, I will go into that a little later, probably. Okay, but... Uh, but but when you were talking about uh, plays like Sakharam Binder or uh, Vultures or Gidhade, uh, in other words, or sometimes even um, uh, Ghashiram Kotwal to, uh, you know, to uh, talk about it in that way, uh, is really to create a history of uh, certain kinds of images, okay, that can be applied to censorship in cinema as well. And you can actually see that censorship in theater and censorship in cinema uh, can be understood almost in the same manner. Okay, and in a country like India, I think I'll be drawing uh, a little bit on that. 
Okay, but uh, to begin my uh, talk on censorship, I really would like to begin with uh, my personal experiences as a child uh, growing up in the 1990s. That, that was my moment to grow up. That was my moment to see India. That was my moment to understand India and not only understand India, but to understand also myself along with India that I was growing up with. Uh, so what was I seeing in the 1990s when I was growing up? I remember the first thing, okay, in the adolescent years, of course, the first thing that you remember about censorship in cinema is the song called Choli Ke Piche Kya Hai, right? <laughs> and uh, this is where my personal uh, uh, beginning uh, or my personal understanding of censorship actually uh, begins with songs like Choli Ke Piche, right? Then there was a huge controversy, I remember, about uh, the Shekhar Kapoor film called Bandit Queen, uh, starring Seema Bishwas. Uh, this was a film about Pulan Devi. Um, and not only, I think, uh, some factions of the uh, quote-unquote public uh, got very upset with the film, but I think almost everyone was upset with the film except for a few filmmakers, few uh, intellectuals and so on and so forth. And there, has, uh, there was a huge controversy regarding a film like Bandit Queen as well. Mm, then I think growing up, there was uh, Bombay by Maniratnam. Okay. And that gave us a completely new understanding of censorship at that point in time, because for the first time, uh, a very intelligent argument was being made by a person like Bal Thakre at that point in time. And you can replace uh, that name with any other in the contemporary era, uh, just if you are talking about censorship and what kind of arguments were put against films. Uh, here, for the probably for the first time, we were seeing a phenomenon where an individual politician could actually replace the authority of the state very, very efficiently by being the part of the state where the government was actually run by the Shiv Sena and the BJP in Maharashtra. And here you could see a phenomenon where Bal Thakre could claim that you know, he is the state or he was the state uh, on two counts. One, that uh, he could give orders to, uh, to people to go and, you know, protest against the film like Bombay. That is one sense. And two, and, and film could be taken off. But at the, uh, on the other hand, he, he was also the part of the state machinery as, as someone who was running the government, okay, either directly or indirectly. And that gave a new aspect. Uh, that with that emerged a new aspect of censorship in India, uh, in cinema. I can give you many examples like that. I'll, I'll just quickly go through the list that I've uh, made out of my memory and also by referring to a few articles, books, etc. So you have a film like Kama Sutra that comes uh, in the 1990s and it creates a sort of controversy and, you know, censor, censor board steps in and suggests a few cuts, excisions, etc. Then you have film like Fire, by Deepa Mehta, okay? And uh, subsequently, you also have a film like Water, and uh, both of them get into huge controversies. And even before the film is shot, there are protest demonstrations, etc., that are going on in relation to these films, okay? Then you have, um, along with cinema, you also have other kinds of activities that you connect with censorship that is happening in the public. And I'm deliberately beginning with how censorship is beginning to expand in India, especially in the 1990s as we are growing up. So I remember distinctly that, you know, you, you also had an occasion where Salman Rushdie's books uh, like Satanic Verses were being banned by the Indian state on demand, you know, uh, or, or uh, with the demand by certain groups to ban the book. You also have, uh, you know, one of the, I think, biggest hyper-masculinized probably uh, you know, quote unquote, fascistic and definitely majoritarian spectacle of the, you know, uh, century in India. Uh, that is the demolition uh, of Babri Mosque, mm, you know, that happens in 1992. Uh, all the developments of cinematic censorship that are coming from the public, I don't think can be understood without paying attention to certain ways in which the public is being mobilized and the acts for which the public is being mobilized during uh, the 1990s. So along with Babri Mosque, you also have 
a similar issue going on with, let's say, in the art world with M. F. Hussein uh, as a painter, okay, whose uh, whose paintings about Indian goddesses, especially, come into conflict with understanding of certain um, you know people and and their views about how Indian gods and goddesses should be represented. And not only that, if you go into the history of that, uh, we will probably hear in numerous arguments where representatives of the quote unquote mob telling you that the issue is not uh, what is being represented. The issue is actually who is representing it, right? And people questioned M.F. Hussein's Muslim identity okay, uh, as, as an artist to actually you know, create that kind of art. Uh, you also, you know, I remember because I've been, a, uh, been part of student politics, okay, in the 2000s, uh, you had uh, a great, you know, a huge uh, incident of huge implications taking place in Bombay University, where a book by Rohinton Mystery called Such a Long Journey was uh, protested against by the Shiv Sena, okay, and, uh, and, and its student wing saying that it refers to Bal Thakare in a very derogatory manner. Uh, and you know, that incident becomes an incident which propels Aditya Thakare onto a national stage, onto, onto the stage of politics, really. So uh, growing up in the 1990s, okay, in relation to censorship and cinema was actually to notice some of these things. And as I think Prabodh Parikh in the chat box has also mentioned, Okay, you cannot forget the work of Anand Patwardhan as a filmmaker. Okay, and I'll come to Anand Patwardhan as a filmmaker and the issues uh, that Anand Patwardhan's films uh, bring up. Okay, in the area of censorship. The reason I went to this memory, okay, is is very very clear. This was this, in my understanding, is to a certain extent a new form of censorship that starts emerging in India. Although it does not mean that these kinds of incidents did not happen in the past. Sunil's talk was precisely about how these kinds of incidents were central to censorship in uh, theater arena. But in cinema, it starts you know, happening on a regular basis, especially during the 1990s. Okay, and I'll draw your attention to two vectors here, and I'll come back to these two vectors. One is the rising a threat to Indian democracy by the new right wing or the Indian right wing, which is becoming more and more powerful. Uh, so all kinds of mob censorships are taking place in the context of the new right uh, becoming a very formidable force uh, with its politics of majoritarianism on one hand, uh, and also implicit within it, certain kind of fascistic understanding of the Indian uh, society, which is uh, actually creating a framework of superiority and inferiority of citizenship. That the primary citizens are superior citizens and they belong to one religion called the Hindu and the other citizens are secondary citizens. This kind of scheme starts becoming extremely prominent during the 1990s. The other vector in which we need to place these uh, particular kinds of acts of public censorship in the context of globalization. Right. As a force starts uh, pulling India into one direction, supposedly, quote unquote, modern direction, you can see that there is a proliferation of uh, pre-modern ideologies that exist side by side. And so far, we haven't seen any indication that these, quote unquote, modern, okay, or uh, globalization modern uh, and, quote unquote, pre-modern ideologies there is no indication that they are coming into conflict at all. Rather, they are very happy to stay together and work things out for themselves. And I'll come back to this particular vector or these two contexts uh, towards the end of my talk, okay, in order to bring about a particular approach uh, to understanding film censorship. But having said that, let me take up a few recent cases and then go into what uh, has emerged uh, in, in the history of Indian censorship in cinema, okay, in terms of two committees that were formed, one in 2013 and one in 2016. One was formed under the Congress government, central government, and the other one was formed under the BJP government in 2016. Okay, the
context for forming the 2013 committee uh, led by Justice um, Mukul Mudgal mm, was formed because there was an impetus uh, that came from two uh, films. One was a film called Arakshan, and that film faced a flack from a lot of people uh, in the public arena, uh, saying that this film is an anti-reservation film, this film is anti-Dalit, this, this film does not take into account the point of view of the people who are marginalized, and it just propagates the Bollywood model of some kind of cultural superiority of the upper castes. That was one criticism that came from the public. Uh, here, it's interesting to understand that you know, uh, we need to understand that this criticism is, is, although coming from a mob, is sort of uh, derived from a different logic of what films should do. Okay, this is not like demolition of Babri Mosque. Okay, there are similarities and there are differences that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the second uh, film that uh, you know that proved to be uh, a reason for formation of Mukul Mudgal Committee in 2016, yeah, 2013 was a film called Vishwarupam, uh, which was uh, which was a Kamal Hassan film, and that film faced a flack in Tamil Nadu, and the state government of Tamil Nadu uh, tried to ban the uh, release of the film, the exhibition of the film, uh, on the basis, on the reason that it does not uh, show Muslims in a favorable light. And uh, Kamal Hassan was supported by a lot of people across the film industry, although there was uh, accusation against Mumbai-based filmmakers that they are not really supporting the South Indian film industry. And to a large extent, that's true. Okay, but uh, prominent voices like Shah Rukh Khan and Karan Rohar also ended up supporting Kamal Hassan, uh, vouching for his secular credentials and his uh, his work as 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 a filmmaker. Okay, these two films finally led the Congress-led government to form a committee called Mukul Mudgal Committee, and that committee came up with particular kinds of uh, recommendations for um, you know for 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 understanding film censorship in India and how can we tackle this really a menace of, of film censorship by the mob? How do we do that was the, was the question behind it. Although uh, Mukul Mudgal committee did not end up suggesting two radical uh, measures uh, for the Indian state to undertake in order to uh, you know, deal and tackle with the question of censorship, uh, it came up with certain kinds of uh, really good recommendations. And I'm going through those recommendations a little bit because we need to understand what those recommendations are in order to make sense of what the BJP government has been doing of late to uh, the Indian Censorship uh, Cinematograph Act 1952. But before going into this, let us see what Mukul Mudgal Committee tried doing. Uh, first of all, the Mukul Mudgal Committee suggested that, uh, you know, the change in the uh, title of the censor board, CBFC, has really not done much. Earlier, it was Central Board of, board of Film Censors. Later on, it became Central Board of Film Certification. This change from uh, film censors to film uh, certification has really not done much uh, in the functioning of uh, the CBFC. The CBFC still functions in the same manner where the CBFC has given itself the right to suggest certain kinds of cuts, certain kinds of incisions, certain kinds of edits uh, to a film. And I'll come back to this particular issue a little later. So the change uh, has really not done much. This particular uh, thing was very important to understand because what Mukul Mudgal Committee was trying to point out is probably one of the basic debates that has become prominent in today's society is whether the film censorship board uh, or the uh, Central Board for Film uh, Certification should have any right to actually suggest edits and change in films themselves uh, while offering certification, right? That has become a big point and Mukul Mudgal Committee was aware of that. And mentioning that in the recommendations has done a hell lot of good for uh, our understanding of censorship. Uh, the second, it, it basically suggested many other things about how the committee should be formed, et cetera. I won't go into that. Okay, but I will come back to uh, two things. One, it suggested that we right now have, uh, you know, certain kind of classification for certifying films where 
uh, four categories are used. One is called U category to a film. It basically means unrestricted public exhibition, right? So, uh, which basically means anybody, anybody, anybody can watch the film in uh, public. A uh, suitable for public exhibition, restricted to adults. U A uh, unrestricted public uh, exhibition with endorsements. That is basically means that in under parental guidance or something like that. And then S is basically suitable for public exhibition to members of any particular profession or any class of persons, which is a very specific category. These are the four categories that we have for film censorship. And Mukul Mudgal committee suggested that we, we may need to add two more categories to this. And they suggested that we may add 12 plus and 15 plus as two important categories that can come into or between, uh, or that can uh, actually divide the UA certification given to the films. Uh, it also suggested that the, and interestingly, and this is where I think the crux of the matter also lies when we come to understand these censorship acts in India. Okay, it also suggested that censorship should remain in the hands of a central uh, government body. Uh, and once the decision by the central uh, body is given for film certification, the states have to simply implement that order, right? And the state's responsibility then is to maintain the law and order situation. Here we hit upon, I think, a very, very interesting feature of the Indian democratic system, which is uh, where, where are the powers you know, going? Are they centralized in the hands of the central government? Or are, you know, do we, to what extent do we divest these powers through the states as well? And therefore, this is actually a question of uh, federal nature of the Indian polity itself, as it is, uh, you know, elaborated on in the constitution. I'm not saying that the issue is solved, but I'm saying that censorship is a field that opens up many issues for us to take into consideration. Right? Uh, the most important recommendation that Mukul Mudgal committee gave was the recommendation that the, there was a tribunal that was established in 1983 under the uh, guidance of the uh, Supreme Court, the 1967 judgment uh, in K.A. Abbas versus Supreme Court, uh, uh, sorry, versus the Union of India, a Supreme Court judgment okay, asked or uh, recommended that a certain kind of tribunal should be formed. This tribunal is called Film Certification Appellate Tribunal. This is called uh, FCAT. Okay, what was this tribunal? Now, this tribunal was very, very important, especially uh, for many filmmakers. Uh, and I'll go into who these filmmakers were later. But this tribunal was important because this tribunal probably was the highest body within the film censor, uh, uh, within the Central Board of Film Certification body, which could take the final decision about whether the film needs to be exhibited or not. This body was comprised of certain legal experts, filmmakers, and many eminent personalities. And the function of this body was to take a decision very, very quickly. Uh, this was, there used to be very, very nominal fee that filmmakers had to pay to this tribunal. And once they paid the fees, they applied. If, they, if the censor board, initial committees did not give a favorable uh, certification to a filmmaker, then the filmmaker could apply to FCAT, okay, and uh, the FCAT could come up with a decision really, really quickly, thereby saving time and money that was very, very important for filmmakers, and especially independent and small filmmakers. What the central government has done today is that in, in you know, a, a few months ago in April, what the central government has done is that it has scrapped this body primarily. The huge reactions that we saw from the industry that is, uh, you know, in the, from April onwards are actually reactions to this particular body being scrapped by the uh, central government of India. Okay, they, uh, they said that actually we haven't done much. That's, that's the argument of the central government that we haven't done much, but we, uh, we have just, you know, uh, uh, made an addition that, if the central uh, board of film certification gives a particular result, then we can actually 
uh, ask them to reconsider their decision. That's the only thing that we have done to, uh, you know, the Cinematograph Act that exists as of now. That is not the case. The central government does not want to tell you the truth. The central government actually want, uh, has, has scrapped this body called FCAT, which was a body to which small filmmakers, uh, from which small filmmakers and indie film, independent filmmakers uh, derived huge kinds of benefits because this was a body that could really go into the issues and they re and and if you look at the history of this FCAT, they have taken very very sensible decisions and favorable to many small and independent filmmakers who are trying to explore issues about the Indian society who do not who may not want to make films because they want to earn money but they, they you know they definitely wanted to make films that raise questions about what it means to exist as a human being in the 21st century in India with all its contradictions, right? What the central government has done by scrapping this, okay, is that they have asked filmmakers now, small filmmakers, to actually approach high courts, right? If the censor board says no for you to get a film certificate, then the only authority that you can go to directly now is the high courts immediately. And just imagine, when a small filmmaker or an independent filmmaker makes a film by borrowing money from a lot of people so that they can make intelligent films, sensible films, uh, you know, films that talk about issues that, that pertain to the real lives of people right now, the central government has in one stroke killed that possibility for an independent or a small filmmaker. There are two things that emerge out of this. One. The central government's understanding of filmmaking is largely connected with films only coming out of Mumbai uh, and big film industries that require a huge amount of money, which are backed by studios and multinational corporations, right? And the, I don't think that the uh, central government wants to hide that fact anyway, right? When in 1998, Sushma Swaraj gave industry status to Bollywood, right? she had exactly this kind of understanding in mind of cinema. Cinema that is made by only big production houses, cinema that is not made by independent filmmakers, cinema that is not made by small filmmakers. What is the problem for us, for people who think about cinema yeah, in this particular way? Well, on one hand, obviously, this kills off any kind of creativity that you have or, or artistic expression right in the butt. It, it, it really kills it right at the beginning. Okay, It doesn't even allow it to blossom even a little. That is the first problem with this. The second problem is this, with this is that if you think about cinema and if you ask a very basic question about what is cinema, right? we all know that cinema is a technology. But what kind of a technology is this? This is a technology that emerges with the modern world, with all its liberatory uh, kind of impulses during the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And cinema emerges at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th with all these impulses carrying forward. Cinema is a technology that allows you to open up a new possibility of thinking, of dealing with the world of perceiving the world. That is the crux of cinema, right? Central government of India today has taken a decision that wants to kill this particular possibility. Because just think about it. Technology is now, a lot of people do have access to technology in certain ways. You can shoot uh, films on mobile phones as well, but where do you exhibit them? Yeah, if you don't exhibit your film, there is no meaning to the shooting, right, that you do. And therefore, the point is that the central government has actually, you know, uh, actually uh, killed the possibility of the very democratization of cinematic technology within the Indian society. So the central government here okay, can be understood or one uh, impulse behind central government's act of scrapping FCAT is also to uh, you know, kill any possible democratic development of cinema that might be related to thinking and rationality and opening up multiple possibilities of dealing with the world. That is what uh, the central government has done with this particular act. Uh, the Sham Benegal Comi uh, uh, Committee uh, 2016 okay, had 
recommended similar things. It had also recommended very radically that censor board uh, should not remain, uh, you know, uh, should not have the right to even suggest any excisions and editing to a particular film. Rather, it should remain only a certificating certification giving body certificate giving body that it can only certify films it cannot suggest it cannot act as a moral compass that's these are the exact words uh, that are used in sham benegal report of 2016 uh, apart from that you know uh, sham benegal report also suggests different kinds of uh, classification criteria for film i'm not going into that okay. however the central government has done nothing about these two reports Okay, these two reports must be right now in some stack somewhere in uh, in offices in Delhi, and I'm not very sure what is going to happen to these files as well, as the central government is now removing many of the buildings that could okay uh, have uh, you know uh, stacked these these kind of uh, files. Okay, the point is, can we understand this particular act by the central government? Okay, in isolation, can we attribute certain kind of impulse, okay, only to this particular government. And as a student of cinema, uh, and as a student of uh, how cinema entangles gets entangled into larger domains like law and public sphere, my sense is no. My sense is that if we want to understand what this is, we have to go actually, right at the beginning of independent India, um, and even before that, but I won't go into that as Sunil has very elaborately uh, talked about censorship and what it meant in colonial India, right? But we have to go at the moment of inception of what is called the 1952 Cinematograph Act. The 1952 Cinematograph Act came into being okay, after a lot of deliberation, right? With the view that uh, the central government needs to understand film as separate from many other arts okay although that has not happened we know that as Sun from, as sunil has already talked to us about that but the central government okay of uh, of the independent india actually wanted to understand film as a completely different art that could have uh, impact and consequences on how people think in independent india okay by doing that they also wanted to make the cbfc Okay, through a statute, they wanted to make it uh, into a law and form CBFC uh, under a central government law. Okay, most, uh, if you look at many of the uh, liberal societies, many of the first world societies, we realize that this is not how censorship has worked, especially in these countries, okay, which have really liberal codes of, of film censorship. Okay, but in India, uh, the CBFC was made into a statutory body. By making it into a statutory body, the central government opened a very fundamental question, which was, okay, is film a medium that needs to be governed by the central authority? Or do certain states in which different kinds of cinemas were being made okay, have any right over the cinemas being made in those states? And the central government did not want the states to have any say in that except to maintain the law and public order. Uh, and this is one huge uh, area that has dominated the, the film censorship acts and subsequent, uh, subsequent amendments to the film censorship act that we have in place. Okay, the second thing that is implicit in the 1952 uh, Cinematograph Act is is a particular carryover from the colonial period. In the colonial period, the censorship was formed on the basis of a very, very patronizing attitude that the British government had towards the, uh, towards the colony, towards India. And they had put themselves in a superior position and they had considered, considered Indians as naive, as childish, as people who do not have a sense of rationality do not have a sense of how to understand films. On top of that, the British had banned a few films, okay, especially the American ones, because they did not want Indians to look at the white ladies of Europe. 
right? And they were extremely concerned with how the Indians are actually getting a chance to look at women, the European women, okay, and pass on you know lewd comments. And and the British were absolutely sure that cinema uh, is not a medium that the Indians can understand at all, right? The reality is somewhat different, right? The Indians were perfectly in a position to understand what cinema is. Lala Lajpat Rai's comments, okay, uh, are very, very prominent in this. We will come back to these comments later in, in question answer session. If I have like two minutes, okay, or five minutes to end my topic. So this particular relationship that the British government had with the Indian people of keeping themselves in an elite position and considering the Indian people themselves as naive was carried forward by the new government that was elected, that, that came into power in, uh, in independent India. And that government put itself into a very, very elite position and sort of put the Indian people into the category called naive people who do not understand what cinema is. Rather, they need to be told how to understand cinema. My sense is that this particular understanding okay, emerges okay, because give me two minutes and I'll end it. This particular understanding of the Indian state emerges out of some kind of historical uh, background to the nationalist freedom struggle that we had. The nationalist freedom struggle uh, created and was created out of conditions where a historic compromise was struck between uh, let's say the representatives of quote unquote modern society, the liberal society, and the representatives of uh, the pre modern ideologies. And that compromise was struck by keeping the people themselves away from any kind of sharing in power. These two dominant elite groups came into uh, uh, came to strike a, uh, some kind of partnership, and they formed. Uh, the dominance over the Indian state, although it was uh, an expression also at some level of what the Indian people wanted, right? The expression, the anti-imperialist expression of the Indian people. However, it did not materialize in the way in which probably the Indian people wanted it. And therefore, the Indian state became uh, or was hegemonized by these two dominant elite forces. Right? What we see in the history of censorship is an interesting paradox. The first few years of censorship from the independent India, uh, 1947, 1950 to almost 1990 is where the primary contradiction in the censorship was between the state and the censor board on one hand and independent filmmakers and artistic, uh, you know, uh, 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 artistic collaborators on the other. Right, where when a filmmaker made a film, the state intervened to say this film can't, cannot be shown. Right, on many occasions that happened. On the other hand, okay, now what we see is that okay, the very people who were left outside the purview of sharing of power have started feeling that they were never given an opportunity to have any say in this. The particular expression of mob control of film that we see today has emerged precisely from this particular paradox of the Indian state that we had. And therefore, and this has to be understood as a mob expression that is led by an ideology that proudly proclaims its pre-modern roots and its pre-modern identities. And it proudly probably also may uh, proclaim in the coming years that it stands decisively against the politics of any form of equality and progress of the society. This particular voice, okay, can, is, I'm sure everyone understands that now, is represented by the central government that is at, uh, that is in power today. The BJP's decision to strike uh, off the FCAT okay, is an example of precisely this, that they want the mobs to continue expressing themselves in an quote-unquote unruly manner, and that is what the BJP 
once uh, probably perhaps okay this is what one can infer from what the bjp has been doing because unless the bjp does so it cannot uh, continue the politics of pre modern identities on one hand and two it cannot keep uh, itself as the champion of the cause of the people who have been left outside the purview of sharing of power only last thing i want to end it with is in this case where does the road lie i think the road lies not only in understanding film censorship as you know not as something that has to be regulated okay with uh, with an iron fist but censorship as a political battlefield in which the ideas of equality the ideas of rationality the ideas of reason have to be championed within the field of society within the uh, public sphere by progressive forces which are represented by uh, by uh, groups like anveshan i hope that ladai badi lambi hai lekin i hope that we finally emerge victorious in defense of reason in defense of uh, democracy and in defense of uh, freedom in our quest to understand cinema and censorship thank you good thank you so much uh, nikhil and sunil uh, that was a very comprehensive and a much needed discussion on censorship and cinema uh, there's a question uh, that's been put in the chat box uh, is there any resistance movement going on in maharashtra uh just to yeah is there any resistance movement going on in maharashtra against the censorship law mm -hmm. uh, like not submitting the script to local police is there any dialogue happening between the police and the artist community uh, would you like to take that up uh, sunil or nikhil uh shall i answer that the the, the first part sure sure uh well you know um so what happens is that these 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 processes and these procedures are built into a system of uh, theater making and performance all right so um if you don't have a censor certificate uh you are not going to be allowed to perform in a formal space right It's similar to cinema, right? If you don't have a censor, your film can't be exhibited. So it's built into that. Um, but if you decide, and if your your practice allows you to move out of formal spaces, then the system is not geared to monitoring that, right? Okay. Uh, it's very interesting. So you can either do it deliberately, or it can just happen as a phenomenon, and. of late i mean we have been studying this now for the last 8 or 9 years there's been a of course this is all pre pandemic you know like before the pandemic there was a there has been a proliferation of smaller performance spaces in cities across the country right and this also points to something else but the point is that there were there, there have been i mean theater makers are not depending now any more on the formal spaces right they there is a there's a demand and you know either theater companies or young you know entrepreneurial spirit they've set up little spaces which you can go and perform you know for maybe 30 people 50 people etc but in cities across the country now these fall below the radar of any you know of any monitoring body i mean it's impossible virtually impossible for them and it's also interesting that you know because they don't follow the rules that apply to a formal space uh you're also not expected to submit a census certificate very often i mean nobody is really nobody even many of them don't even know that that is a requirement so it's there so willy nilly this 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 thing has led to a certain loosening of that kind of control um there are also other strategies that uh, theater makers employ when they actually submit something for you know scrutiny uh but you know perhaps this is not the forum to talk about it as far as a dialogue happening between the police and the artist community not at all i don't think the, the police is an administrative the performs an administrative function in terms of granting licenses you know it's one little room at the corner somewhere and recently uh, under huge pressure from you know uh, large 
uh, event management companies that bring big shows. They said, yeah, listen, get rid of, you know, we don't have to, we can't be applying for several licenses just to do a show. So suddenly one day out of the blue, there was a notification in the Gazette that said that now we don't need a performance license. We don't need a ticket selling license. We just need a census certificate and then we can go ahead and perform. So these have been the reasons. There has been no real deliberate um, movement to actually resist this as far as I know. And as I said, uh, Amal Palikas, uh, you know, the, the, he filed a petition in the High Court uh, asking for censorship to be moved. But personally, I feel that it was not something mm -hmm. that was shared and discussed in the theater making community so i don't know how much support that particular petition had i think i think I, this is my belief that when you set out to do something like this it makes strategic sense and of course it's also more democratic that you try and include the large part of the community to back it so whatever the reason that hasn't been resolved yet yeah any uh, comments from you nikhil on the question uh, well, could you repeat the question? Because uh, for like one or two minutes, my audio did not work. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, is there any resistance uh, movement going on in Maharashtra against the censorship law, uh, like not submitting the script to local police? Is there any dialogue happening between the police and the artist community? Well, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure that there is any movement like that where the uh, you know, police and... Uh, uh, artist community have come together to form some kind of uh, platform on which such deliberations can take place. But I think as Sunil was saying, certain kind of, uh, kinds of informal networks have start, started blooming up. So you shoot a film and you show them in informal settings, etc. These are the filmmakers who are small filmmakers, independent filmmakers. They're not only interested in uh, you know, they, they're not necessarily interested in making money out of cinema, but they are interested in cinema as a technology that can change our perception, a technology that can help us understand new aspects of being human, and so on and so forth. And in that case, a lot of uh, informal public, uh, quote unquote, exhibition spaces are coming up. Okay, uh, so you have screenings that are taking place in juggies, jhoparpattis, in homes, houses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are certain uh, poets, for example, who have written poems, I know I can't take their names, okay, but I was present for some of these uh, readings, okay, uh, where the poets themselves believe that if they publish their poems, uh, the public is not going to uh, uh, like these poems, and therefore they prefer to, you know, write those poems and, and uh, read those poems to specific groups, and then deliberation can happen, okay, such informal uh, platforms are are, are beginning to emerge. Uh, along with that, I think I'll connect it with uh, one question probably asked by uh, yeah, Abhishekta, uh, where, uh, you know, these new informal places, okay, have a formal uh, kind of form, okay, uh, through online content, what we call OTT platforms these days. These are formalized, but so far, until last year, they were not under the purview of any kind of censorship that was coming up, uh, that was there in, in the Indian case. But now the uh, chief of censor board, Prasun Joshi, is of uh, explicit opinion that these films, which are shown on OTT platform, should also come under uh, film, you know, uh, film censorship as the films that are made for public exhibitions do. Okay, and his point is that these are just films. Uh, there is no difference between whether you make a film for public exhibition or for private consumption at home and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, where Prasun Zoshi uh, could not and does not understand the difference probably between okay, the different uses that different exhibition spaces can have okay, and what that opens up. Okay, as a, you know, within the existence of a society. So how is private consumption different from public consumption and so on and so forth? We need to define these fields. We need to do a lot of research on these fields. Without doing research, if you have the same policy for everything, okay, that is not going to serve the purpose. Probably that is going to serve the purpose for the powers that are at the center right now, because by doing so, they want to kill any kind of creativity. 
okay whether that happens in ott whether that happens outside ott and so on and so forth i'm not at all saying that ott platforms are the platforms of you know some kind of liberation of art of course not they have heavy censorship by themselves okay uh, directly or indirectly through the market so it's not as if market does not uh, come into play here market definitely has its own censorship in place right but we need to understand the difference between market censorship state censorship etc and therefore rather than saying right now uh, of course all of us want to live in a society that is censorship free that is our aim that is the society that we want to create okay however we need to figure out the paths that lead us to that society okay if you straight away go for a society that is censorship free okay so in in some sense censorship free okay it's going to create a very wonderful situation for the market to exist okay you may see a few uh, artistic expressions here and there but the market there is not just a neutral force to sit and watch artistic expression taking place okay if they can do something uh, if they can turn the artworks of picasso and dali into commodities which can be sold you know <laughs> for for millions of dollars right what is the you know how are these small time filmmakers going to resist that right uh, that kind of temptation so market already exists to weed out that kind of competition right and therefore we need to figure out what this censorship uh, area actually means okay by placing it in the context also of you know the two two articles uh, that we have in our constitution 191a and 192 Okay, okay, I don't want to go into nitty gritties of those uh, articles right now. We can okay later on and see what the first amendment did to the freedom of expression in the Indian society. But uh, I'm saying that there needs to be a lot more deliberation, and we can take smaller steps. Okay, by actually taking away the power of the censorship uh, censor board to uh, give. uh you know to suggest editing and to suggest excisions etc and by actually reconstituting fcat again that's the first step that's the first demand that we should make as uh you know a community of artists on the you know that's that's probably what i would like to say about online performances etc and the central government has come up now with guidelines to regulate the content that you are going to watch through um, the uh through the ott platforms okay the process has begun since january uh in february itself the you know the ott platforms got scared and came up with their own regulations and rules and they said to the central government that that we won't allow any kind of uh you know uh, 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 content that will create public disorder etc etc and so on and so forth okay so this has already begun i think the larger battles lie ahead in this okay in uh, in order to understand how this plays out so uh that's that's what i would like to say about this great uh there are two more questions i'll just uh, combine them together so there's a question for sunil is there any informal archive on censorship in theater uh, text that got centered uh, censored is the performance rehearsal copy of the text with additions and subtractions available uh, there's that and there's one more question uh, from abhishekta if uh, we've come across many online performances during the last two lockdowns do they come under the purview of the existing censorship laws uh your comment sunil uh, all right uh it's interesting uh yes i think when you say is there an informal archive you will find uh, you will find writing on the idea of theater censorship done by various people uh and if they can be collated that's quite an interesting bit of material uh but just to give you an idea this is a very interesting uh, incident that took place when we were researching um sex morality and censorship because we referred to that play and you know it had fair amount of material so i as part of the research i went to the state scrutiny board office and you know they have a chairman who is not required to be there every day but it was just my luck that that day the chairman was there and i met the secretary of the, the scrutiny board and i said listen i need to look at files that talk about you know old plays that you know might have had some trouble with the censor board so he said why don't you talk to the chairman because he is here today and i walked into this room and there was a gentleman sitting there and uh, he didn't even look up and i said listen my name is sunil shanbag and i'm doing this and he says yeah 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 i know all that i've seen some of uh, the work you guys do what is it that you want and i said well i'm looking for this particular kind of you know material 
So he rings the bell and he calls the secretary and he says, give him the controversy file. <laughs> and that honestly was an archive. It was a fat file and it had all the correspondence on various plays that over the last 40, 50 years uh, have run into problems with the censor board. Uh, you know, Pratap Sharma, Touch of Brightness and various other plays with notations on the side and, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of the recreation of the scenes in the play where Kamlakar Sarang, the producer director, confronts or is, is confronted by the censor board about the play and the cuts that they insist on are actually recreated from the notations on the files there. So, I mean, you know, they were they, they, so ridiculous, this absurd those scenes that no one imagines that that's actually what actually happened so there is the material is lying around um, it needs to be put together i think some scholar needs to get at it sit there get to the offices and actually find that uh, material and uh, put it together i think it would be a fascinating uh, you know study actually great uh nikhil there's a question for you do you think that cinema actually works as an ideological state apparatus? Please elaborate on it, especially in the reference to censorship related to the gender question and the question of women's sexuality in Indian cinema. What do you think if censorship comes under the ambit of ideology or is it uh, or does it come under direct repression or is it a fusion of these two? How should we conceive it in the Althusserian light? Very interesting question. <laughs> Opera. This is a this is a huge question. I'm not so <laughs> sure whether I'll be able to answer all the aspects of this question. There are many aspects here, uh, but uh, you know, of course, cinema is uh, to to answer it directly. Of course, cinema can be considered, and to a certain extent, has to be considered as the ideological state apparatus. Okay, where, uh, where, for example, especially in the case of India, when cinematic technology came, uh, it's not as if the cinematic technology was used neutrally by the society. The cinematic technology was used within the context of uh, power struggle that was going on. Okay, and when India became independent, uh, the primary function that uh, cinema in India took upon itself all the big filmmakers and even the politicians were uh, you know participants to that particular kind of understanding and unwritten understanding where the cinema was considered to carry on the responsibility of building the nation so you look at films like uh, even films like awara films like uh, you know even pyasa to a certain extent comment critically uh, pyasa does but awara uh, film like mother india we have 1957 i think Okay, uh, all of these films are are created on the basis of formation of the nation. What is interesting here, and this is coming straight out of my uh, you know my Enfield guides uh, thesis, okay, is that is that all these films uh, end in a particular way. They end with okay, they 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 are all melodramas, and the uh, although they represent some kind of conflict between rich and poor, etc. In many of these films, you would realize that the person who's actually poor is recovered in the end as the lost son of a rich father, right? And then, okay, it became easier for some kind of, uh, you know, uh, raising the question of poverty, etc., in the new nation, but resolve that question on the side of the rich anyway, okay? And uh, in that case, it can be considered as an ideological state apparatus, which works very indirectly, unconsciously, and not very directly. In the case of gender, we all know the prohibition on the kiss that exists. Okay, uh, there is no rule in anywhere in the uh, Cinematograph Act or amendments uh, following that that one cannot show a kiss between a hero and a heroine or man and a woman at least. Okay, to begin with, a very very basic understanding. Okay, of sexuality, you cannot even show a heterosexual kiss on the screen. There is no rule like that. But Indian filmmakers have followed that. Okay, which needs to be understood as an ideological act on the part of, of the Indian filmmakers, precisely because uh, what the kiss represents in a society like India, okay, which is caste-ridden, where marriages cannot, it is very difficult to uh, you know, fall in love and get married to, okay, uh, to, to the partner of your choice, even today. Okay, so 
when it is so difficult in a caste ridden society like india uh, to resolve the question of love in a manner where two individuals consensually take a decision the kiss represents that kind of possibility it represents a possibility of what is called the private sphere to exist on its own terms right but the unwritten rule seems to suggest at some unconscious level that this possibility is a is a hard hit on the sensibilities of pre-modern ideologies that actually control the state okay and hence okay we don't see kisses even today it is very difficult to see a kiss unless it is in a song and dance sequence okay in the indian film right because song and dance sequence is already a fantasy space anyway it's not very realistic and therefore the kiss that inaugurates the moment of the private is actually what is the representation of that private is what is unconsciously banned or was to a large extent unconsciously banned in the indian cinema and in that sense okay uh, indian cinema is an example of okay some kind of struggle that is going on uh, on the formation of the state itself right the struggle that i'm talking about uh, about forces which control the indian state on one hand so called liberal modern forces on one hand and on the other the traditional elite landlords of the indian society okay this ban on kiss this unwritten ban on kiss is actually a justification of the rule that the landlords have had on the indian state the control the hegemonic control that the landlords have had on the indian state for a long time and it is to ideas like that okay because the inauguration of private is actually a challenge to the landlordian authority okay because they want to control your your houses right but 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 uh, indian and indian cinema has actually followed that particular logic and it is in that sense that indian cinema can be understood as an example of the altruistian if that's what you meant altruistian ideological state apparatus coming to censorship censorship is both okay censorship is uh, a field which operates ideologically through certain kinds of unwritten rules like the example of kiss shows you right uh, and that is generally considered as indecent right so it works as an ideological state apparatus but it also becomes repressive at times where there can be a direct uh, consequence if you don't follow the state right your film will not be allowed to be exhibited your film uh, you know you can drag on the case uh, for a long and long and long time so that you end up losing all kinds of money you all you lose all kind of uh, interest even in making the film what you end up doing is just fighting the case over and over again and therefore you are directly punished for doing something okay right and the recent examples of mob uh, censorship are are an example of that with the with to a certain extent sanctioned by the state itself uh, by by the central government itself right to to this mob lynching and and mob censorship etc okay uh, so i believe that it's it's you one needs to understand the field of censorship as a conflictual field which works as an ideological state apparatus but at times when the time comes it can also work as as a repressive machinery right and therefore it's it's the fusion okay and we need to pay attention to which function becomes more important at which historical time and who are the players involved there which are the subjectivities involved there as althusser might have put it perfect that's a perfect response to it uh, uh since we've already covered utility i'll skip the questions on it uh, just one last question and uh, then we'll close the session there's a question from meshika uh, it's quite a long question uh, is it possible to think about censorship through resistance and not from the point of view of oppression i mean that given how mobilized the state of maharashtra was during independence was the post independent state's fear founded on this potential of resistance that emerges from an existing resistive organized force the indian state post 47 would be disturbed by lower caste class solidarity and the fear of ambedkarite collective action would be strongest in maharashtra or is the continuing censorship a result of it not being challenged
last comments from uh, the two speakers uh, i i think this is a very interesting question i would love to i mean have somebody actually you know think about this and you know actually talk about this because this is a very very interesting way of looking at it um i think i think uh, i think the 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 challenge uh, that was set out even from the time of uh, phule's time especially in 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 you know in 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 live performance uh, was a very significant challenge it continues you will see it even post independence in several movements that take place around maharashtra uh, uh, with the with the emergence of several lok shahis who followed that tradition so i think that particular force has remained for a fair amount of years post independence uh, i don't know whether it was considered seriously enough uh, to be a challenge uh, so i would be very interested in knowing what the you know the, the the answer to your own to this question actually because it interest very interestingly juxtaposes two things uh, so yeah that that's really what i think okay i think uh, this question sort of encapsulates what i wanted to say right at the beginning of my talk when i said that uh, one needs to think about you know how the mob censorship is coming to uh, have an effect on the indian censorship and who are the people involved in it okay these are the people who were promised certain kind of share in power but were never given in a sense okay uh, people lot of people have been um, kept outside okay the power that actually should be shared by all the people where through policy making through education through certain kinds of uh, you know practices such as health being given to everyone etc okay the question uh, i think uh, the way in which i understand it is okay that maharashtra was a place okay in which people actually did show okay before independence that they wanted certain kind of share in the power in order to chart out their own chart out the possibilities of their own lives in an egalitarian manner with a desire for equality and this vision was shared by ambedkar while writing the constitution this vision was shared by a lot of people especially the communists as well okay who wanted to create a society in which everyone would get equal share in power in wealth in everything that that you know uh, that the society makes for itself mm, and this did not materialize right in a sense uh, the state is definitely disturbed by lower class and lower caste solidarities because the lower class and lower caste solidarities in essence are demanding for life with dignity and life with dignity means sharing of power not only in terms of its material uh, aspect okay or in terms of material resources but also sharing of power in terms of uh, various identities being treated okay with equality now uh, this particular sentiment this particular idea of desire for equality coming from the lower class lower caste solidarities is what we should keep at the center of our politics and posit as the norm of our politics which is what has not happened in the last 40 i mean i'm not saying that we haven't made any efforts to do that but we all know what the challenges are and how those challenges do not allow us very easily to keep the lower caste lower class solidarities as the norm okay to fight against the powers the 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 you know oppressive powers that are at the center in that i think uh, this is a field okay and and this is where we can understand the battle for and about censorship okay uh, to be removed from the society which will be fought not in the area of cinema only not in the area of censorship only through legal battles and so on and so forth but this is actually a field of what we call social revolution in order for actually censorship to go away finally what we need is a society that is formed out of principle of equality which is the truly modern desire 
anything that does not allow us to establish a society of that okay will necessarily have some kind of censorship that is feeding into the powers that are ruling india right now you know and this is not a question only of what the central governments are these are the powers that are operating in our families these are the power that are operating in our schools education system health system and cinema as well okay in a sense i think uh, one line from karl marx brilliantly encapsulates this the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessities comes to an end our fight is that to end the realm of necessities to take care of everyone's needs everyone's necessities which is when every individual okay can take their own decision and hence okay one can understand right now our our fight which is not only limited to creation of a wonderful india okay which is driven by the spirit of equality which is what the constitution gives us it gives us the spirit of equality right but the problem is in although that is the spirit in real life this is not how the society is we need to take our society towards that spirit okay and i think the large uh, classes you know large uh, uh, number of people do want to move towards that but somehow you know many uh, obstacles are put in their way and and the way is lost right it is our responsibility to to also keep talking to people to uh, not only have a give and take but also to learn from people regarding what these desires for equality may mean for the life to come and therefore i think uh, i think this is how i see this question and the possibilities that it opens up for discussion perfect i think the session couldn't have come to a better end uh, very well put sunil and nikhil uh, so on behalf of anveshan i'd like to thank both of you for having taken out time on a saturday evening for this talk uh thank you and uh, i'd also like to thank the attendees who've taken out time for this talk uh before ending the session uh i must remind you about the documentary screening that we're going to have tomorrow so we'll be screening devolina's film gay india matrimony tomorrow and i'm once again going to share the link for registration in the chat box registration uh, is a must the link to join the screening will be sent around 11:30 tomorrow morning it's a noon show start at 12 so uh, please do register and i hope to see you all tomorrow and uh, thank you have a wonderful weekend thank you thank you thank you thank you sunil it was a thank pleasure you, and an honor pleasure. yeah absolutely pleasure to be here thank you Bye.